right, thanks for the intro. So the, the subject of this work is gonna be focusing on secure multi-party computation. So here we have a setting of a collection of parties, each with some secret input, Xi. And these parties want to compute some function f on these inputs. So a secure MPC protocol is a means for the, the parties to communicate such that at the end of the day, everybody learns f evaluated on the inputs and nothing else about the inputs. Uh, and this, this holds even if some fraction of the parties have been corrupted. So I'll be representing this by the, the red uh, evil guys. Okay, so to, this is all just sort of background right now. To define security for an MPC protocol, they, they turn to what's known as the real ideal world paradigm. So in the real world, this is what's really going on. The parties are talking to each other, some of them are corrupted, they're seeing this entire view of the protocol. And the ideal world is kind of what we'd ideally want to capture by the protocol. So suppose that there really was some trusted third party, everybody gives their inputs to this party, he computes the value of F, and sends back just F on the inputs. So we say that a protocol is secure if for every adversary in this real world setting, there exists an adversary in the ideal world who can simulate the entire output of the experiment. And this is really capturing that whatever he's actually seeing in this real world protocol execution is kind of worthless, that, the, that this could have just been, uh, the only thing he's revealing is the function output. Okay, so here's a question for you. What happens if the adversary actually has partial information on the secret inputs of these parties? And this is, this is not a, a new question. In fact, way back in the 80s when uh, multi-party computation was first coming around, uh, this, this question already sort of came up. So suppose that somebody enters a protocol knowing the first half of one of the, the secret inputs. And we wanna make sure that by running the protocol, this doesn't suddenly unlock, for example, the rest of this input. Um, so this is formalized by saying, for any auxiliary input that's given to the adversary, this is some in partial information on the party's inputs, uh, that, that we wanna say, obviously he knows this information, so that the simulator will need this to simulate, but that this doesn't reveal any more information. So this is the exact same security definition here, but now quantified also over possible auxiliary information. And the, the, the adversaries in the two different world get also the, the auxiliary information in addition to everything else they had. Okay, so, so this is, this, as I've mentioned here, this is sort of like the standard, standalone MPC uh, security definition. And this uh, auxiliary information is really, I wanna refer to this as a static auxiliary information. So note that this handles anything that could have been learned before the protocol execution. But now as soon as the protocol starts, uh, it's assumed that no side information can be revealed. Today, I wanna talk to you about adaptive auxiliary information. So we'll be addressing this question of what happens if, for example, the adversary, maybe by some side channel attack or some other means, um, is able to learn partial information about the secrets of honest parties. So whereas before um, we modeled the static auxiliary information, it was some function of the, the secret inputs, now we actually have a bit more information floating around. There's more secrets going on. So not only are there the inputs, but there's also, uh, for example, randomness that's generated as part of the protocol execution. So we'll model adaptive auxiliary information by allowing the adversary to request functions li and receive back li on, on the states of the honest parties. And the question for today is what security can we still achieve in this setting? So just a, a quick fresh on uh, the prior work in this sort of setting. So I'm gonna kind of use interchangeably adaptive auxiliary information and leakage. So people have considered this sort of model uh, for specific functionality. So say that you just want to be able to accomplish zero knowledge or commitment scheme. And there's been much, much less work of trying to do, what about general functionalities? You wanna be able to do this for any function f. So it was a very important work of Vitansky, Kennedy, Halevi that really served as an inspiration for ours, actually. And in this work, they provide a definition of what security would mean, and also prove composition theorems about this. Okay, so our definition is actually not exactly the same as what they use, so let me go through and uh, give our definition. So for the intuition to try to keep in mind with this real ideal world is that whatever is given to the simulator in the ideal world, this is sort of the information that you're allowing, you're giving up on. So for example, the function evaluation is gonna be given. 
And obviously, so if the adversary leaks some information, say he leaks some bits of one of the party's inputs, this information you have to give up in, in the, the, the ideal world. He's learned this information. But what we want to make sure is that no additional information is leaked. So this is kind of the intuition here, what we're trying to achieve. So as a warm-up definition, let's say that maybe he leaks some number of bits in the real world, so five bits or something. Then say that we allow the simulator the same number of bits in the ideal world in order to simulate. So this, this actually does guarantee some amount of security because it's saying that, okay, uh, no more than five bits are revealed. But this is maybe not quite as strong as you would want. So for example, uh, it doesn't say anything about what are these bits. Maybe if in the real world he's leaking some total garbage or just a bunch of zeros. Uh, we don't want this to now reveal additional information on the secrets. Okay, so caveat, what I'm about to say is kind of technical. Um, so this, this is really the final definition that we use. What, uh, so in the ideal world, the simulator is simulating this execution, and we require him to maintain at all times a simulated state of all of, uh, all of the secrets of the parties during the protocol as a function of their inputs. So now in the real world, if some leakage uh, function comes along, say he leaks you know, a bunch of zeros and some bits of the input, the same leakage function will be applied to the simulated state. And uh, so this definition is actually quite similar to the one of Batansky, Kennedy, Halevi, with a, a slight tweak, um, which is sort of, this is a, in some sense a joint leakage on the inputs here. Okay, so yes, that's a bit technical, but here's kind of some intuition to keep in mind, that this is something that's beyond bounded leakage. Uh, so, so for simplicity, think about the two-party case where one of the parties is corrupted. So there's really one kind of one secret input X here. In this case, our definition captures several different leakage notions. So instead of just bounded output leakage where you have some context on the number of bits, also things like bounded entropy or, or noisy leakage. So for example, uh, suppose that this leakage function that's asked has a bunch of garbage in it, a bunch of zeros, and then a small amount of information on the input. Okay, well the thing that we're revealing in the ideal world is the exact same function evaluated on this. So instead of leaking, you know, however many number of bits on the inputs here, it's just limited to the small amount of information. And similar with computationally hard to invert functions. I also want to emphasize that our, our protocol does not have any sort of a priori leakage bound. So it's very common in, in leakage resilient cryptography to have the following sort of setup. So first, choose some bound lambda, maybe number of bits or maybe amount of entropy that you, you want to protect against. Then grow the parameters of your scheme based on that. And then at that point, sort of just cross your fingers that when you actually use the scheme, nobody can leak more than lambda, otherwise security breaks down. In contrast, in our scheme, in our protocol, we have a, a graceful degradation of security. So you don't need to fix beforehand uh, any amount of leakage that sort of after which there'll be a threshold. Instead, just the more leakage that occurs, the more the security degrades, but it's graceful. So this brings me to the our primary theorem. So for every poly size circuit F, we provide uh, a protocol that's secure against adaptive auxiliary information in the, the definition I described. We actually achieve something known as uh, universal composability security, it's a bit stronger, quite a bit actually. And this is in the, the common random string model, so assuming everybody has access to a shared randomness. Our protocol can handle any number of, of malicious corruptions and is based on a collection of, uh, of assumptions. So here the linear assumption by linear groups and nth residuosity. But I want to emphasize actually this is sort of the, the beefiest version of our theorem. We actually get a lot of different trade-offs based on uh, assumptions and, and properties. And in fact, even if you go down all the way to just DDH, we get meaningful results. So just uh, an example kind of place where this, this could come in handy uh, is where, where the underlying functionality has some sort of leakage resilience built in itself. So, so note that the guarantee that we provide is that partial information of the inputs will be revealed, but not the whole thing. So for example, if the inputs uh, that parties are holding on to are something where it's okay where you leak partial information, maybe they're secret keys of some underlying primitive that's leakage resilient to, to some bounded amount, 
Um, also, there was an additional work of ours where we actually achieve MPC with, with sort of full leakage resilience, where no information is revealed about the inputs by combining the, the present work together with uh, leakage resilient circuit compilers. Okay, so let me uh, let's kind of shift gears a little bit and start talking a bit about the construction. So at a high level, a common approach for, for constructing MPC protocols is as follows. So first start with sort of a weaker protocol, one that's secure against semi-honest uh, adversaries. So these are the ones that are assumed to follow the protocol honestly, but can maybe combine information among parties. And then add a few components in order to, uh, to enforce that parties actually must act semi-honestly in the protocol. Okay, so the first question is, can we just, can we mirror this approach in, in our setting? So maybe if we get each of these pieces individually secure against adaptive auxiliary information, we'll be good to go. And this seems uh, like a good start. So there's actually, you can achieve a lot of these things in the way that you would need. We end up running up against a very solid wall. In fact, it, it, it turns out that it is impossible to achieve the, the, what property you would need from this coin tossing in the well. So here the coin tossing, the purpose is to enforce that adversaries actually use good randomness instead of malici maliciously chosen randomness. So sort of just an intuition, uh, kind of high level to keep in mind of uh, why this, this really is a problem. Uh, the, the issue is that no matter what protocol you're trying to use in order uh, to, to achieve this coin tossing, there'll exist some point, some say round of communication, where if one party is corrupted, he can leak the following function on the secret state of the other party, which is what bit should I send next in this protocol in order to bias the outcome as much as possible? Okay, so obviously this approach is not going to work. And so instead, we take a different approach. Instead of trying to construct something that's uh, very, very strong and generic in this case, what we'll do is we'll push this up into the beginning part. So instead of starting with something uh, that's secure just against, some, uh, just against adversaries who are assumed to follow the protocol completely honestly, we'll instead strengthen this here and also protect against parties who follow the protocol but can potentially choose bad randomness, completely malicious randomness. And we'll refer to this as semi-malicious adversary. Okay, and it turns out, so once, once we construct this, uh, together with the components that, that do have these security properties, we will be able to get malicious, full, full malicious security. Okay, good, I do still have time. Okay, so this brings me, this, this really is the technical core of our work, trying to construct this, um, multi-party computation protocol that's secure against semi-malicious adversaries, ones with bad randomness. And in fact, boiling this down even a little bit further, this reduces to just uh, oblivious transfer with the same security properties. So <clears throat> let's start uh, by just talking about, so this is, this is sort of our starting point of an oblivious transfer protocol. Okay, so this is, this is based on just any public key encryption scheme with the ability to, uh, well here I'll get to that, to obliviously sample public keys. And it works as follows. So recall that in this in oblivious transfer, the sender has two messages and the receiver should receive just message X, X sub B. So in the first round, the receiver will generate two public keys for the encryption scheme. Uh, for his bit B, he'll generate it together with a secret key, and for the opposite one, he'll generate the key what's known as obliviously. So in the sense, he doesn't know how to decrypt uh, with respect to this public key. Okay, well, so now maybe you can see how this works. The sender will just encrypt each of his two messages with respect to the, the two different public keys, and it'll have the property that the receiver can decrypt the one that he's after and can't decrypt the other one. So this provides security in the semi-honest uh, case. So as long as the parties actually follow the protocol honestly and actually generate their randomness correctly, uh, this works. And actually it was shown by, by this, again, this paper, Batansky, Kennedy, Halevi, that if you use a, a good encryption scheme that has sort of leakage resilient properties, that this, this still holds in the semi-honest case, but where you can also leak information. So it's leakage resilient. So our challenge, is how do you handle the bad randomness? So let, let me just kind of show you here an example of where 
uh, the, if the adversary chooses bad randomness, you're kind of hosed. So here, I mean, you could see it right at the very beginning, actually. So when the, the adversary is supposed to obliviously sample some public key, what does this mean? He's generating some randomness, and we're sort of trusting that he can't decrypt with respect to this randomness. But for example, there's nothing stopping him from generating this, this public key together with a secret key, and then just claiming that he, he generated the, the public key obliviously. In which case, a lot of the security breaks down. And in fact, there's also a similar attack on the sender side. Um, it's a little bit more intricate. Okay, so, so this, uh, this is kind of the, the fun part that I don't have very much time to talk about. So please talk to me afterward if you're interested. Uh, but this, this is really, these are our technical contributions. So the first technique that we have is to design a new OT protocol building on top of this that has the property that's secure as long as the adversary's randomness is not in a very s small bad set. So note that uh, the original actually doesn't even necessarily satisfy that. And we, we achieve this using lossy encryption. So kind of the, the high level uh, teaser of how this works is that the, this, the green spot, so the good randomness, will be public keys that are lossy. So if you encrypt under these keys, you actually completely hide uh, information theoretically all information about the, the message. This will be used for the second message that the receiver is not supposed to learn. Okay, so maybe this is some progress, but not really, because the adversary can just choose his randomness in the bad set. So our second technique is, uh, to, is construction of a new randomness generation procedure that will ensure that the adversary can't hit inside this bad set. And note that actually the, the real challenge here is that we want to be able to do this without any sort of leakage bound. So things like maybe if you wanted to do some sort of weak coin tossing protocol where you still ensure uh, that the adversary's randomness has some entropy in it, it seems like this approach is really not going to work. So we do this uh, using lossy trapdoor functions. So this, this is a family of functions that have two different kinds. Uh, so some of the, the functions are bijective and they're indistinguishable from functions that are information theoretically shrinking, they're lossy. And what we do is every time somebody's supposed to generate a random, random string, say, they first sample something random in the domain, and then actually use the randomness that's the, the image under their, their function. So honest parties will be given bijective branches where they really can't hit anything they need to, and malicious parties in the simulation will be given lossy branches. So they can't tell the difference, but it'll be the case that actually the lossy branch is so shrinking that it doesn't even intersect the bad set, that no matter how hard he tries, no matter how much information he leaks, he can't hit something in this bad set. So putting these two techniques together, uh, this actually is sufficient to achieve the, the goal of semi-malicious oblivious transfer and thus um, semi-malicious MPC. Okay, so to sum up, uh, just sort of a review with some of the takeaway ideas of this work. So the first is this notion of adaptive auxiliary information. Uh, second is the, this intermediate level of semi-malicious adversaries. So this is actually similar to, to some other notions that have been considered of intermediate steps between semi-honest and malicious. Um, but this one in particular was very useful for us. And finally, uh, so I, from the one minute description that you got to see, this new randomness generation procedure via lossy trapdoor functions. And actually I think this, this in particular is one of the pieces that can probably find applications in other, in other areas. So th uh, that's our work and thank you very much.